As a small business owner, you deserve more. More confidence, more connectivity, more of the tools that help your business thrive. And at Cox Business, you can expect more from us. We don't just have sales reps. We have perfect plan identifiers. People who will work with you to make sure your business gets everything it needs and nothing that it doesn't. Your business deserves more, and that's why you can expect more from Cox Business. Call 800-526-8572 to switch today. When I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. All right, yeah, our roster looks great on paper. Whoop the hell. Whoop the hell. All right. All right. But at the end of the day, we better be a good team. Be a good team. And you start building that during this time of the year. Time of the Get year. your sorry ass up. Get your sorry ass up. Doing a lot of talking with somebody that ain't do shit today. Doing a lot of talking. Do you think you're better than Jarrell Revis is right now? Is I'm better right than now. you. My 24 years of life, I'm better at life than you. Dang, dang. Time to go to work. Hey, that's sick. I ain't never seen you before, huh? Back up, Tanner, coach, you need some help. We're going to expose you, boy. All right, we coming at your ass. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Roundtable. Let's go! Let's go! What's going on, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Football Roundtable Podcast, proud members of the Full-Time Fantasy Podcast Network. You can find them at FTFPodNet on Twitter. You can find me at SportsFanaticMB on Twitter. You can find my co-host for the day, Mr. Matthew Fox, at Nighthawk7734 on Twitter. We are just one of a ton of great podcasts that are associated with this network. Some of the others are Jim Day of FF Champs, Corey Parsons, and Dr. Roto from SiriusXM Radio. Bob Lung of the award-winning Fantasy Football Consistency Guide, Dwayne McFarland, Blake Sullivan, and a ton of great others. Your one-stop shop for all of your fantasy news, advice, and strategy. And you can find all of us on FullTimeFantasy.com. We are also excited to be partnering with ExpandTheBoxScore.com, XT Box Score on Twitter. They have some of the best stats in the industry, NFL, baseball, and of course college football stats as well, which are extremely hard to come by. I use them for all of my college stuff that you see me posting on Twitter. They are definitely worth checking out. Just $15 for a year membership, and if you use our code ROUNDTABLE, you will get 10% off of that. The best deal in the industry when it comes to stats. If you're trying to improve your your fantasy uh, game or you want to get in more on the stat side, definitely check them out. It is well worth your time and money. And again, use code ROUNDTABLE to get 10% off. Matt will be joining me here in just a minute, and we are going to jump in and break down half of the week 10 games as we had six teams on a buy, so just 20 12 games this week. We've had 11 play, broke down Thursdays, obviously, and then we got the Monday night football game tonight that is going to kick off here in a little bit. So me and Matt will kick off six of the games that we saw yesterday, and then we'll talk about the rest of them on tomorrow's podcast. Let's get Matt in here and break down some of the games from Sunday. Hello! Hey, we've got Mr. Matthew Fox with us. Matt, how you doing? How was your weekend? Doing pretty good. Put up uh, the pine tree and cinnamon scent in my office, so it's been like Christmas in here all day. Oh, very nice. So I got an important question. Are you one of those people who uh, likes to get ready and celebrate Christmas now because some people consider it a season, or do you wait till after Thanksgiving to start hanging up the Christmas tree lights and start celebrating Christmas? My wife, if I let her, would probably put things up October 1st, uh, so she's uh, she's going to put the tree up tonight, I know. I went and fished out all the Christmas decorations for her. Um, nice. I I like Thanksgiving uh, in terms of holidays. I think it's more fun, a little less pressure, especially uh, for my job. I always end up working quite uh-huh. a bit on Christmas Eve, so... Gotcha. I like Thanksgiving a little better, but the Christmas season, uh, you know, my wife's been watching Hallmark movies every weekend. Oh, We've been man. having Hallmark movie dates the last two Saturdays, so. I hear you. You know, funny enough, that is the same way my wife is. We don't necessarily watch the, the whole, I don't, but I, she does watch the Hallmark movies, but once, ho- she loves Halloween, so once Halloween ends, like November first to her is it's automatically Christmas season. Like she she doesn't yeah. have pay any attention to Thanksgiving, and I'm with you. I, I like it with my job. 
Uh, we actually get off Thursday and Friday, so I get the nice four-day weekend. I get to eat a lot of food, sit down and watch football all day. Like, for me, it can't get any better, but I can understand why she's not necessarily a big fan of that holiday as uh, she's not really into football that much. So, you know, I guess I can understand it. The gifts and all that stuff is uh, a lot more fun for her and the kids than it is for me. So, makes sense. I just wanted to, to, to figure it out. I know some people who are listening to Christmas music in October before, you know, before we even hit November. I'm, I'm, I'm iffy on it. A lot of my family is very much, they, they love to celebrate Christmas as a season from like November to December. So I've just kind of grown used to it. So I'm always interested to hear how other people handle it, uh, in their households. Prepare for glory! I don't know if you got your popcorn ready. If you got your popcorn ready. I came out the wrong line already. And he's hit the end zone for an unbelievable touchdown. I would be honored. Throw it up above his head. They can't jump with me. Golly! Oh, they tackle him at the 40-yard line. Who can make a play? I can. Who can make a play? I can. <laughs> All right, let's see here. So as I talked about on the uh, in the intro there, we're going to do six of the games from yesterday. And we are going to start with uh, the contest I imagine nobody was watching, and that was between the New York Giants and the New York Jets. The Jets pulling out a 27-24 victory in this one. So for the Giants... Daniel Jones goes 26 of 40 with 308 yards and four touchdowns, adds 20 yards on the ground to come in as QB2 with 44.8 points. Saquon Barkley struggled a little bit, and this one just did not look right. Um, I, I was slipping back and forth between a bunch of different games, and, and whenever I was watching him in this game, he did not look like he was healthy or really wanting to be out there. Just one yard on 13 carries, 30 yards on five catches to come in at RB22 with 9.6 points. Darius Slayton has the big game here, 121 yards, two touchdowns touchdowns on 10 catches to come in at wide receiver 2 with 34.1 points and Golden Tate wide receiver 7 with 23.5 points in this one 95 yards four catches and two touchdowns I would imagine we're getting closer and closer to the playoffs now we got uh, the Giants are on a bye next week so you won't obviously be able to use Barkley uh, next week, are you worried about him moving forward? Though we did see that he looked, it looked like he came back really quickly from what seemed to be a very serious ankle sprain. Did not look fully healthy out there. I imagine if he plays throughout the playoffs and everything, you're playing him. But are you worried about him? And if your trade deadline hasn't passed in a redraft league, would you think about trading high on him now to possibly bring in some big name players? Yeah, a friend of mine actually um, got some interest uh, from the guy that owns Michael Thomas wanting to peel off Saquon Barkley. And before the last couple of games I had been, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. That might come back to bite you, but you know, right. he has not looked right all season. I think it's, this has been a tough season for a lot of the marquee running backs. Yeah. If you took them, you know, if we set aside Christian McCaffrey, you haven't gotten the number one overall pick kind of return on Barkley Kamara has just been okay. Ezekiel Elliott has just been okay. Le'Veon Bell, who was also we'll talk about from this game, has just been okay. I, you know, it's just it has not been that you know that big boon of a year. He hasn't looked right. He's been banged up. He supposedly went for X-rays after the game. It said Shermer said today that he thinks Barkley is feeling much better after being banged up. What does that even mean? Yeah. And I know he's not getting the blocking. It was something like he had negative 13 yards before contact yesterday on his 13 carries, which means he was getting hit in the backfield all the time. You know, it's amazing. I I think on the flip side, we, we have to consider some of what Daniel Jones has done this season to be pretty amazing, considering Sterling Shepard's pretty much not been there. And yep. Saquon Barkley hasn't been himself. We wanted to see what Daniel Jones could look like leading this team with all their pieces. And he's looked pretty good without having any pieces. Obviously, a decent matchup yesterday. But, you know, he and he ran for 20 yards on three carries. Barkley, we know his talent, his all-world talent. It's feeling more and more like a lost year. And in redraft, yeah. I would think, you know, usually having the number one overall pick, which was pretty much unanimously Barkley this year, puts you in a good position for making the playoffs. I'm curious how many people took him number one are still in the playoff on. 
I mean, I'd imagine not a lot because that that stretch that he went through, obviously with without with the injury, is probably what ended up costing a lot of people. And like I said, now he he's still he's been putting up decent numbers. And I'm as someone who owns him in a couple dynasty leagues, he's he's been putting up good numbers, but not the numbers you expected, not what we saw last year. So whether I'm hoping it's just the ankle injury and not anything else, but there's a, there's all kinds of rumors flying around about him. And I agree with you on Daniel Jones. I think Daniel Jones has actually been one of the better quarterbacks of. Uh, of this class, I mean, I, I would almost outside of Kyler Murray, who has been phenomenal, I would say Daniel Jones is right there. Like he, he got all this flack for not necessarily his fault for being drafted where he was by the New York Giants, but he's been amazing. I'm mean, outside of the turnovers, the fumbles, which he can work on and improve on. He's been really good. Would you be Would you be intrigued at all about possibly picking him up and playing him at all through the playoffs? He does have a couple really good matchups again. The the turnovers are, are what's going to hurt you, especially if you play in a turnovers league. But I know he has uh, Washington, Philly, and I can't remember who the other team is. Um, the Dolphins. So, so you you wouldn't have him for Week 11 because they have right. a bye, which is kind of crucial. Week 12, they're at the Bears. I wouldn't consider that a great matchup. No. Week 13, they're home against the Packers, which I wouldn't consider a great matchup. For the fantasy playoffs, he has at the Eagles, which isn't terrible – home for the Dolphins at the Redskins. So he might be somebody, if you're thinking about stashing somebody and playing matchups, if you're going to make the playoffs, Yeah, I could more see playing him in the playoffs than in any of these three crucial weeks if you're trying to make the playoffs. Yeah, I agree with you on that part. Like if you, you've got a guy like a, I'm trying to think of a couple, like a, a Baker Mayfield, uh, maybe a Josh Allen, Tom Brady, who's been okay but not great. Like some of those middle-tier guys, uh, Daniel Jones with that matchup, because we've seen he can beat up on bad teams and, and good teams. I know obviously the the Jets here are not necessarily a good team, but he's had some pretty good games against uh, very good defenses as well. Again, it's really just been the turnovers for him uh, that have kind of haunted him this year. On the Jets side, Sam Darnold actually doesn't have any turnovers, which is good as he, oh my goodness, I said 27 to 24, didn't I? They won 34 to 27. That, that's a my bad. 34 to 27. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, now that I corrected that, Sam Darnold, 19 to 30, 230 yards and one touchdown coming in as, um, oh, let's see here, QB, I don't know what I just did. Man, I'm all messed up today. He also had a, uh, he also had a rushing touchdown, three for 25 and a rushing touchdown. Gotcha. I missed that. I see that. 25 yards and a rush down. Okay. To come in as QB9 with 28.45 points. Le'Veon Bell has a mediocre day. I mean, still finishes well, I guess, in fantasy, though. Gets you uh, 34 yards on 18 carries and a touchdown. Also adds 81 yards on five catches and a touchdown to come in at RB9 with 16.8 points. Jamison Crowder continues to ball out with Sammy Sleeves here. Or Sammy Spleen, I think is what everybody's calling him now. Uh, 81 yards on five receptions and one touchdown. Uh, wide receiver 10 with 19.1 points. And then Demarius Thomas, wide receiver 21 with 14.4 points, 84 yards on six catches. With the way Crowder has looked here the past couple of weeks with Darnold, has he moved at all into your flex territory, or is it still Bell the only player you're willing to play from this offense? Yeah, first of all, isn't Sam Darnold's uh, nickname the Ghost Whisperer? I mean, I it might be that, too. That. I, I like Sammy Spleen, but that's probably a little bit of a, uh, I should say, probably a mean <laughs> nickname for him. I, so, well, so is the Ghost Whisperer, too, I guess. Now, neither one of them, I guess, would be very flattering to him. <laughs> Uh, Jamison Crowder week, week one, right out of the gate with Darnold, uh, looked great. His, uh, value really dropped off when Darnold was out. And as soon as Darnold has come back, he's bounced back up. I think he's a good start. <clears throat> What's been surprising a little bit, you know, we saw Robbie Anderson have a couple of decent games this season, including one in that win over Dallas, but it really seems like Demarius Thomas is the other, uh, if you're going to reach and flex somebody out of the Jets, group he seems to be the one uh that's the other one and of course um we saw herndon come back barely play and now has cracked ribs likely out so ryan griffin might be somebody that's interesting uh going forward because it sounds like herndon's gonna miss uh some time and we had seen him develop a connection it really the one that seems to be losing out big time is robbie anderson and bell yeah. i have some concerns i you know he might he might be more into flex range territory too. 
he gets a touchdown, which is nice, but four for 34 isn't exactly light and passing on fire. And yeah. 1.9 yards per carry as a running back. The Jets have a lot of problems, and I think that's been part of the struggle for Darnold and Bell. Um, probably some of the same problems. Both these teams, ironically, probably have some of the same problems. I mean, Daniel Jones got sacked six times. We talked about Barkley getting hit behind the line of scrimmage every time he got the ball. Neither of these teams block very well, uh, and that's going to be something for us to really maximize fantasy value that hopefully they can get cleaned up for next year. Yeah, so they have a, a bunch of really good matchups leading into the playoffs. Unfortunately, the last two weeks, 15 and uh, – or I'm sorry, yeah, 15 and 16. Mo- most of the leagues, at least I play in, are 15 and 16 uh, for the championship last two yeah. games. Um, he has Raven Steelers, which obviously you really don't probably want to play Le'Veon Bell in those two. Those are likely bad matchups for him. But uh, next week, moving forward, four really good matchups, Redskins, Raiders, Jets, and Dolphins. So I actually kind of like all those. I would imagine he <clears> – <throat> I'm sorry? Bengals. The Jets are playing the Bengals. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, so, I mean, for those, I'm with you. I think he's flex probably at worst, uh, but definitely at least RB2 value. I'm with you on Ryan Griffin. I, I'm, I was someone who was really high on Chris Herndon, obviously, this year. I have him in a lot of leagues. I thought him coming back, he would he would on, almost automatically come right into the lineup and and produce the way that Ryan Griffin has. We see that those two have a really good connection. If you were someone who has Chris Herndon and you can get Ryan Griffin, I would do it because uh, I said he 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 was phenomenal. He was a top ten tight end uh, for four or five weeks with Sam Darnold. And I think that connection continues. Um, it is interesting to me about the whole Robbie Anderson thing. I'm, I think I want to save the the decline or the topic of his decline for Thursday because I want to do a little bit of dynasty discussion with you and Tony, and I might use him yeah. as someone to. Uh, we need to figure out if he's someone you should try and buy on in the offseason or not. Because in Dynasty Leagues, I mean, he's a guy who has a lot of talent. Maybe if he ends up somewhere else, he could show it because he, he can be, a uh, uh, I think, a restricted free agent. So the Jets will technically have the first shot at keeping him. Uh, but it definitely interesting. Now, I'm, I'm extremely surprised after what we saw with the back half of last year with Sam Darnold and the way he's, he's kind of come out this year and really struggled. We've got well, a, you know, we saw too. Woody Johnson kind of gave a uh, vote of confidence to Adam Gase, or that they were going to be patient yeah. with Adam Gase. The team looked markedly better Sunday in what was a pretty good matchup. If they can continue to look better the next four weeks, we might get something close to what we thought we were going to see out of this Jets offense. That'll give us some hope for next year. I think it's just. You know, they've had some games even against teams like the first matchup with the Dolphins where they just got waxed and you're like, oh, this is not a good sign. See, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm going to read too much into the next couple weeks because they're playing really bad teams and then it kind of goes into a team we'll talk about here a little bit as well and the Browns uh, beating up on teams that they, that they should beat. They're, they're bad NFL teams and then people are going to get their hopes up. I think, oh, this team is actually good, and and these players are good. When really, you know, you're just beating the teams that you should beat. It's not necessarily uh, what we're seeing. I guess if that makes sense, I could be wrong on that. I'm not going to look too much into into these next couple games because I'd imagine, especially with as bad as the Bengals and the Dolphins secondaries are, if uh, if Robbie Anderson goes off for a bunch of points, I'm gonna I'm gonna chalk it up more to matchup than possibly connection with him and Sam Darnold or or his skill level kind of coming back up. All right, next up we've got the Lions and the Bears. The Bears pulling this one out and, and possibly saving Mitch Trubisky's job, beating the Lions 20-13. to On the Lions' side, uh, pretty late Saturday, there was a lot of talk that Matt Stafford would miss due to some broken bones in his back. He, he did end up sitting. Jeff Driscoll of Cincinnati Bengals fame from last year came in 27-46, to 46, 269 yards, one touchdown, one interception, did add 37 yards on the ground to come in as QB10 with 28.31 points. J.D. McKissick, the best uh, running back on the day, 36 yards on 10 carries, added 19 yards on 6 catches to come in at RB18 with 11.5 points. Kenny Galladay, 57 yards on 3 catches and a touchdown. Marvin Jones, 77 yards on 5 catches to come in as wide receiver 26 with 12.7 points. TJ Hawkinson also had a decent day, 47 yards on three receptions. How worried are you about this Lions offense if we know Matt Stafford, or if we find out Matt Stafford won't be able to play for a couple weeks? This offense, from what I saw, looks completely different with Jeff Driscoll out there compared to, to Matt Stafford. 
Yeah, I mean, they already don't have a good running situation. Um, you know, they were struggling to run when they had carry on Johnson. It's been a complete wasteland uh, afterward. I, you know, what you were really relying on was Stafford was a great start. Galladay and Jones had appeal. Sometimes a guy like Amendola had appeal. I think that all is going to start taking somewhat of a backseat. Uh, the Lions are not appealing in any way. Uh, I think if Stafford misses significant time and, you know, I know they, they keep talking about he was real close to playing, wanted to play yesterday. When you're talking about broken bones in your back, to me, that does not yeah. sound great. Yeah, I'd be worried about him. It's it's crazy to think how well he's been playing. It was, you know, uh, John Hamlers, who who came on with us uh, earlier in the preseason, talked about how he thought a big year for the Lions were coming, and they've really been in every game. And, uh, you know, a, a different – you know, follow the ball here or there, and the Lions could actually be over 500 and, and be a really interesting team. Uh, and, I mean, Matt Stafford has been playing out of his mind. I think you still can trust Kenny Galladay and possibly Marvin Jones uh, if Jeff Driscoll is still the quarterback moving forward. But, I, I yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I'm not worried about this running game at all. I, I'm not going for J.D. McKissick. You know, we don't know if Ty Johnson will be back, suffered a concussion. So, for me, it's just Galladay and Jones. Uh, on the Bears side here, Mitch Trubisky finishes QB7 on the week with 29.72 points, 16 to 23, 173 yards and three touchdowns. Uh, did add eight yards on the ground. David Montgomery struggled big time on this one, 60 yards on 17 carries. Uh, Tariq Cohen, 23 yards on four catches and a touchdown, adds 14 yards on three carries as well. To come in at RB15 with 13.7 points, Allen Robinson, wide receiver 20, with 14.6 points, 86 yards on six catches. And then Taylor Gabriel pops up again on the uh, on the scoreboard here. Touchdown, 39 yards and four catches. For the Bears, uh, I thought that... Uh, Montgomery would have a decent game here. The Lions had kind of been leaky against the run, so I kind of failed on that one. Uh, but Allen Robinson continues to be really good. I mean, he's had a couple bad games here and there, but in all honesty, I would imagine he'd be a lot worse with the way that Mitch Trubisky has been. Uh, I think he he's easily, uh, a, at least at worst, a flex player for me moving forward. Um, but what are you thinking with him and with David Montgomery? Is it time to put Montgomery on the bench after a couple good games? Or are you trusting him moving forward, just uh, possibly a bad game here against a good matchup in the Detroit Lions? Yeah, poor Allen Robinson. What's the guy got to do to get a real quarterback? Spends first part of his career <laughs> know, with right? Blake Bortles. And now, <laughs> now Mitch Trubisky, I mean – you got to consider he might be one of the most talented wide receivers of his generation that he keeps putting up numbers like this with passers that you're looking at like, oh, my God, is that really an NFL quarterback? So, you know, I'm, I think you continue starting him every week. Um, this game, obviously, a bummer, leads the team in targets, six catches for 86, and every time they got close, it went to Gabriel, went to Ben Brandecker, uh, went to Tariq Cohen, you know, just went away from him. Yeah. Montgomery, I think you're also still starting. He's consistently getting a lion's share of the running back touches. Um, disappointing in this game. It seemed like it was a good matchup. Detroit, you know, I think the week before had let Josh Jacobs run all yeah. over him. So yes, a little bit, uh, a little bit confounding, especially with Chicago being at home. Also a little confounding. We had seen Montgomery stepping up and being a part of the passing game, which he wasn't in this one. I mean, they only threw 23 passes, uh, so you see Cohen getting more work. But, you know, I think it's just an off an off game. You know, if you're going to roll out Ronald Jones, if you're going to roll out <laughs> anybody from Detroit, if you're going to roll out some of these, it's, you know, when you find a running back that is going to be the guy in a situation, you're putting him out there, and sometimes – Nature of the beast, you just don't get the return. Yeah, that is true. Don't talk don't talk bad about my boy Ronald Jones. He had himself a game yesterday. And we're not gonna talk about them today, but I liked what and I saw. And yet the leading Always. rusher for the for the Buccaneers, yeah. still Peyton Barber. That's all right. Peyton Barber still sucks. He did almost cost him the game though, in Ronald Jones. That was I was a little worried about that. If that happened, I think he'd have been rele- relegated back to the bench. 
Uh, next up, we've got the Baltimore Ravens and the Cincinnati Bengals. Baltimore making this really not a contest at all. 49-13. to Lamar Jackson continues to just ball out here. 15-17, 223 yards, three touchdowns. Added 65 yards on one touch and one touchdown on seven carries. And had probably one of the best spin moves you will see in the game uh, last week or yesterday finishing his QB3 with 43.17 points Mark Ingram RB23 with 9.4 points in this one 34 yards on 9 carries and a touchdown Marquise Hollywood Brown wide receiver 14 with 18 points 80 yards and a touchdown on 4 catches and then Mark Andrews has a big bounce back game here 53 yards, 6 catches, and 2 touchdowns. So after 4 weeks of not scoring, Mark Andrews doubles up scoring this week. I think he's safe. If you, I don't imagine he took him out of your lineups anyways, but if you did, I feel like he's perfectly fine to put back in. Ingram, I feel like, is kind of exactly where we thought he was going to be. We've talked about him what it feels like a couple days last week where he's going to be, he's going to give you okay numbers, but unless he gets you, a, you know, touchdowns, he's really not going to come through for you. Had he not gotten the touchdown, he really would have not come through for you. Um, and Hollywood Brown makes it, makes his way back into, to starting lineups. At least for me, I talked about it on Friday's podcast. Uh, he looked like he was healthy. I, you know, you have to like the connection he has with Lamar Jackson. I said, throw him in your flex spots and he definitely came through for you. Are you willing to put, uh, Marquise Hollywood Brown back in your lineup? And then, uh, you have your thoughts changed at all on Ingram? No, thoughts haven't changed too much on Ingram. I also think the fact that they were up huge most of this game impacts a little bit of the work a guy like Ingram gets. You know, they're not worried about throwing him out there. They're saving him for later. Um, Brown, I don't think is consistent enough and the passing game consistent enough to put him uh, in in some kind of a starting lineup and feel good about it, especially in these crucial weeks. I mean, he only had four targets yesterday. He gets a 49-yard touchdown that kind of salts things up. A guy I might be more interested in grabbing and stashing is Nick Boyle, who seems like he's getting quite a few targets and making a presence felt. And I think tight ends in this particular offense are a little bit of a safer bet. Um, you know, Boyle only had four targets too, but he caught four of them for 78. Um, and he's been consistently getting targets throughout. Um, that just, to me, feels like a safer bet, especially at a kind of a weaker position. Might be somebody I'm picking up and keeping an eye on during the stretch run. But the Ravens, you know, I looked at a couple of things this week. Their next four games are all kind of against uh, contending teams. They They have the Texans, the 49ers, the Rams. Uh, I can't remember who the other one is. So, that, you know, they could be in for a little bit of a touch. Uh, so the they Bills. have Texans, Rams, 49ers, Bills. That's yeah. a little bit of a tougher stretch. Then they get a game with the Jets, which ought to be good. And then you end with two big division games, Browns and Steelers, that could have a real impact on the playoffs. So they look really good right now. But, you know, I'd be a little wary of this next three weeks in the run up to the playoffs on the first playoff week, especially that some of those teams are pretty good against uh, oh, yeah. the pass and locking down. Like if you're talking about a Hollywood Brown Texans pass defense has improved. Jalen Ramsey likely going to be on him from the Rams. 49ers have Richard Sherman and a pretty tough back end and the bills have a pretty good pass defense uh, as well. I mean, we saw how they were able to keep OBJ in check yesterday, even in a game that the Browns ended up winning. So, you know, that's uh, that's another thing to consider when you're looking at the Ravens. I disagree with that a little bit, but we'll get to that with when we get to the Browns game on on them locking down Odell. I agree with you on that. I for me, it, it, I've been very uh, staunch in. Lamar and Andrews are the only ones that I'm trusting. Now, again, Mark Ingram has, has, for the most part, I think proved both of us wrong. We both talked about how neither one of us were really high on him, and he's had a fairly decent year. He's definitely come down from what he was at earlier in the year, which is when we were both advocating to sell him at his highest point. If you did, you probably got a good return back for him, and you're really not hurting that bad. Um, the only reason I had advocated Hollywood Brown on Friday was because of the matchup. I do, for the most part, agree with you. My my one thing with him, and this is what I said on Friday's podcast, is if you play in a deep league, uh, you know, if you're in like a 12-team league with, with two flex spots or 14, 16-team league, 
I would feel fine throwing him in my flex spot because it just takes that one play. He has that speed that he can just get. He's he can get the three catches. You know, he's going to get you some games where it's whatever two catches and fifteen yards. But then he might also get you that game where it's four catches and eighty yards and a touchdown because he takes one to the house. So if you're playing in a deep league, I'd feel fine. I'd feel safe starting him in a flex spot every week. If you're not, you're just playing in that standard twelve man two wide receivers, two running backs flex thing, I'm with you. I'd have to play the matchups on that. Is that, is that a fair um, way to value Marquise Brown for you? Yeah, I think so. You know, yeah. and He's a young receiver, too, in an offense that isn't exactly the most robust passing offense. Yeah, yeah uh, you know, that's what – yeah, Lamar Jackson is the next coming of Michael Vick, I see, because he goes 15-17, to 17, and again, they only, they only threw the ball 17 times. But I, I don't want to get into that right now because Lamar Jackson has looked amazing, I just think. The way he's played this year, he's done a lot more running than than passing, and people are talking talking about how he's perfect passing all the time, and I just don't see it. He did make a couple good throws yesterday, so I'll give him that. Uh, on the Bengals side, their rookie Ryan Finley got out there and made his first start, probably going to play the rest of the season so they can see what they have out of him if they need to go quarterback in the draft this year. Likely going to be the number one pick since the Dolphins can't even win uh or can't even lose correctly because they keep winning games. Ryan Finley, 16 of 30, 167 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. To come in as QB 12, uh, 21 with 14.8 points. Joe Mixon has a little bit of a bounce back game here. Somehow got 30 carries being down big in this for the most part. 30 carries, 114 yards. Did add 37 yards on two catches to come in RB8 with 17.1 points. And then Tyler Boyd, the best wide receiver on the day. Wide receiver 27 with 12.2 points. 62 yards on six catches. I did advocate for starting on and Tate. Uh, did get six targets, so just two behind Tyler Boyd, but just 30 six yards on three catches so not really a great game for him but I do think that him and Ryan Finley have some decent chemistry so maybe you're probably not starting him the rest of the year but he is definitely especially if AJ Green moves on which it kind of looks like is is where it's heading to uh, for next season Auden Tate a guy you might want to try and get now as I think his future could be very bright in Cincinnati what are your takes from this offense altogether I kind of feel like it's just uh a mess, and I really don't think outside of maybe Boyd, who's a flex option, you can start anybody from the Bengals uh, moving forward. Yeah, you got to feel a little bit better about uh, what you saw from Joe Mixon. Uh, if you're a Joe Mixon owner, um, I thought it was encouraging uh, that he was able to get a 100-yard day, um, and obviously they're going to want to try to run the ball, especially with where you drafted Mixon, you probably need to play him. I think, uh, spoiler alert, uh, on whether they're looking quarterback in the draft. If yesterday was any indication, I, I would think they are. All right. Now we will talk about the, uh, the Cleveland Browns and a nice victory Monday pulling off the win against the Bills 19 to 16. Uh, I shouldn't say pulling off the win. The Bills finding a way to lose that game, uh, so that the Browns could win and, 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 you know, make Browns fans happy all over the world. So I'm very appreciative of the Bills for helping us out with that one. On the Bills side, Josh Allen, 22 of 41, 266 yards, uh, does get you a, Get you two rushing touchdowns and 28 yards on the ground to come in as QB6 with 30.9 points. Devin Singletary struggles, which is interesting to me because the the Browns uh, defense, while improving against the run, had really been run all over here. 42 yards on eight carries just adds eight yards on three receptions to come in at RB30 with eight points. John Brown, wide receiver 25 with 12.7 points in this one, 77 yards on five catches. Cole Beasley, 74 yards on four catches to come in at wide receiver 30 with 11.4 points. And then Dawson Knox, just 55 yards on four catches. Singletary, are we worried about him at all? We still saw Frank Gore come out there and get a little bit of work. Not a lot, but they did. Um, you know, he technically really, this was a game for the most part throughout the entire the entire game, the Browns looked a lot better than the Bills for the most part, but just could not get their offense going against a really good Bills defense. So the Bills were in the game the entire time. Devin Singletary, eight carries. Frank Gore, five carries. So the uh, past couple weeks, we've seen Devin Singletary kind of really taking what looked like a stranglehold on this position. Are we pulling the reins back now a little bit on Devin Singletary? No, I think it's just a bad game. You know, Singletary, seven targets, uh, which is good, but was only able to grab three of them and only for eight yards, so that kind of hurts. Wasn't able to make any explosive plays. I think the real thing you're going to see with uh, with 
Devin Singletary and um, a lot of these running backs, kind of like what we talk about with the Baltimore running back, when you have a quarterback that might take goal line carries, you know, Josh Allen ran for two touchdowns here. Yeah, that is true. Um, that, that can sometimes hurt, you know, if even one of those touchdowns goes for Singletary, we're looking at a little bit of a different kind of fantasy day. So these things are going to happen. I still think they have turned a corner and that he's younger, has fresh legs, and is a more dynamic player. Just not a great game flow for them. And I, I've thought Cleveland at times has been pretty good against the run. Um, you know, in the game they lost the week prior to Denver, they were doing a pretty good job of just holding people down. Lindsay yeah. was just able to break free for a couple of huge plays. I mean, he got 71 of his yards on two runs. Right. So, you know, just didn't happen for Singletary yesterday. Yeah, they have definitely, that's why I said they've been improving. Earlier in the season, they were getting run all over. They are not quite as bad as they were earlier in the year, for sure. On the Brown side, Baker Mayfield, 26-38, 238 yards and two touchdowns to come in at QB11 with 28.12 points. Kareem Hunt outscores Nick Chubb, which is just crazy. So just four carries for 30 yards, but does get 44 yards on seven catches to come in as RB11 with 14.4 points. Nick Chubb, RB12 with 14.1 points in this one. Uh, 116 yards on 20 carries. Jarvis Landry, as I talked about on Friday's podcast, was the wide receiver to start. Comes through big here with White on Odell the most of the game. Landry eats a little bit in this one. 97 yards, 9 catches, and 1 touchdown. Odell, they said they were going to force him the ball, and they did. Gets 12 targets. That's not counting the 2 targets in the end zone that both uh, fouls were called on him. So technically got 14 targets altogether in the game. 57 yards, 5 catches to come in at wide receiver, 33 with 10.7 points. We'll start with the running back part here. Um, Kareem Hunt, I w- I, in all honesty, I think he has flex value moving forward. He didn't come in that much and take away from Chubb, but it looks like they had almost what they used Dontrell Hilliard for, which if you follow me on Twitter, you know how much I hated how much they were using Hilliard because uh, he is obviously not the kind of back that Nick Chubb is, but Kareem Hunt has completely taken that role over. I'm okay with that because of how talented Kareem Hunt is. Uh, so I think he's got flex value moving forward. I did like the way that they used both of them in the backfield at times, both blocking for each other and doing different things, running out uh, for different passes and everything. Uh, what do you think with Chubb and Hunt? Do you Are you worried at all if you're a Chubb owner uh, that with the way they used Hunt might hurt him moving forward? Do you find playing Hunt in your flex spot? Just kind of your overall thoughts on those two. Well, first of all, for you, I, I was writing my midseason playoff predictions today, and I, I used that site where I play out all the games. Uh-huh. I think Cleveland, 9-7, and seven, I think they're going to make it in. Oh, God, don't that torture me with prediction this. prediction today. God, I wish they would have lost now, because now you're getting my hopes up again, and I'm going to be dashed next week I, when they end up losing. They have such a nice they last do. seven games. I know. You get the Bengals twice, you get the Steelers twice, you get the... Cardinals, Cardinals, you get the Dolphins. Yeah. I mean, the Ravens are I the Ravens have, are the only game I'm worried the sad about. Storm. You beat the Ravens the first time you played yeah, in Baltimore and hung forty true. on them. That's I mean, true. I, don't I, know. Think, I know. I'm not saying that's not a tough game, but you, I don't think they should scare you. But to your question, I am nervous as somebody that has Nick Chubb. Kareem Hunt has not played in a football game in a year. Yeah. And look at how many touches and how productive he was coming in. It's going to take time to build up a NFL game workload, but the way he looked, I yeah, think, looked would good. make me nervous. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I'll say for Chubb is his day would have been completely different had the Browns somehow figured out a way to score in the freaking red zone. I mean, they had, and I don't know if you watched this game, but they had nine plays from the one yard line. I saw saw all those plays. Yeah. Like, like, you know, if Freddie kitchens, I know, I know. Let's not talk about him. Let's not. It's a good day. It's It's amazing. The Chubb runs for 5.8 yard average, but when you get down at the goal line, he couldn't even get an inch. That's well, not all on Chubb. I mean, no. what happens to their blockers? I don't really get that. Either. So I don't even think it's the blockers. Here's here's what I heard today. I was listening to NFL radio, and they were talking about that, and it made a lot of sense. And I I honestly not even thought about that. When they go in, they even use the Bills as an example. 
when the Bills used Josh Allen to run in those touchdowns, or I think Sam Darnold, it was on his as well, I think they were saying, they spread the offense out. The problem with the Browns is, is when they come into the red zone, they got that one yard line, they have everybody right there, and they even have the wide receivers almost right there with the offensive line. So your defense yeah. knows you're just going to run the ball up the middle, spread that's what they kept saying is you got to spread everybody out. Make them think there's a chance you're going to pass it because if they know you're going to run it, they're just going to take all their defenders and shove it down your throat. And we know that, well, I don't think the Browns' offensive line is horrible. It's not great. The Bills have a really good defense. And if you know that they're going to run the ball, I don't care how good Nick Chubb is, if the defenders are beating people off the blocks and getting in the backfield, he's just not going to score. There was one, um, I can't remember if it was on that one or the second time they got down in the red zone. I think he would have scored had he kept running to the pylon. He was running, um, I want to say it was Higgins was on the outside, had the block. Uh, and, and the defender was moving Higgins back a little bit, but with this, with, with Chubb's speed, I think if he would have kept going to the, to the pylon, he would have scored. Instead, he tried to cut in and then he couldn't make the one defender miss to get in. So that's just my opinion. Uh, but I, I think he could have scored on that one. Uh, you did bring up. You know what's going to cure their red zone problems? What's that? Playing the Dolphins and the Bengals twice. That's true. Well, you know what else is? Is Richard Higgins. Uh, I, I talked about this before. Uh, I thought Callaway was going to be the answer. I was wrong. If, if any of you follow me on Twitter, you saw the tweet I put out this morning because Garrett Price, uh, one of the more well-known people of Dynasty Nerds, it is a big Browns fan as well, said that he thought Rashard Higgins would be the difference in this offense. And, and he was for sure last year. He was the guy that Baker Mayfield looked to in big situations because he was always the second or third guy. Defenses did not have their best cornerbacks on him, and Rashard Higgins made plays. If you watch that touchdown play from yesterday, he completely burned that defender. I was glad to see Higgins out there, and I hope he continues to be out there. As much as I like Antonio Callaway and his talent, Rashard Higgins just seems to fit this offense better. Baker looked better, and I love what I saw out of Higgins. On the wide receiver side, you were talking about the easy matchups they have moving forward, uh, and I said I would touch on the the Baker getting shut down. T- it, if you look at the box score, yes, Baker or Odell did not have a great game against Tredavious White. However, as someone who watched the game, and, and I know some people look at this and say it's it's my Browns bias, but there was two plays in their in their end zone that he could have made the ball or he could have made the catch had Tredavious White not tackled him before the ball even got to him, and that ended up getting them, as I said earlier, the nine plays in the red zone because they had two. Uh, defensive pass interference calls on White on Odell. And on the first play of the game, Odell was wide open for an 80-yard touchdown, and Baker just missed him. So I don't know if you're watching the beginning part of that game, but on literally on the first play, they took a shot to Odell. Odell, within two steps, had Tredavious White beat, was gunning down the sideline, and then Baker throws it and missed him. If Odell catches that, all of a sudden you're talking about an 80-yard touchdown on his resume and then add in the 50 yards as well. So I do think Odell would have had a better game had Baker not missed him. Uh, again, still, Tredavious White is a phenomenal cornerback. I was not expecting a huge game out of him. That's why I said on Friday's podcast uh, to pick up Jarvis Landry. But I am excited about them targeting him 12 times in the game. I agree with you. If they do that here in the next couple weeks against the Bengals and the Dolphins, Odell is going to give us finally back that wide receiver one value moving forward. Do you agree with that? Yeah, hopefully. I mean, it is it is such an appealing schedule. Of course, I, I would say nestled in amongst those, the Ravens will have a better pass defense than when you saw them last time in terms of oh, taking yeah. a number one on because of Marcus Peters. And I actually do not think the Pittsburgh games, while I think they're winnable for you and will be better games for Chubb and Hunt than they will for the pass, uh, pass catchers because the back end of that Steelers defense has been pretty yeah. impressive with Minka Fitzpatrick. So there are some incredible ones. I mean, he's still going to see some tough people. Even Arizona has Patrick Peterson. He may not be what Patrick Peterson was before, but it's still Patrick Peterson. Right. I just think as a team, they're going to fare better. I don't know if it will necessarily – translate into us seeing this season what we thought we might see from Odell Beckham Jr. I actually think Beckham's going to be better in this offense next season if they can have a good offseason program and if they can build some momentum in the second half. I mean, I'd love to see that. As I stated on on Friday's podcast for me uh, and, and everything you just said, 
is why I think Jarvis is an easy wide receiver too moving forward because he easily, outside of the Steelers game, which I agree, I am worried about that because Minka Fitzpatrick has been covering the slot cornerback or the slot wide receivers, and he has been absolutely phenomenal since coming over from Miami. So I could see Jarvis even struggling in those games a little bit, and possibly even against Baltimore, depending on where Marcus Peters goes. I do think Marcus Peters is beatable, and I'd imagine Marlon Humphrey still stays on Odell. So Jarvis, though, is a guy that I'd really be looking to play every single week. Him and Baker seem to have that connection back again, and with with Odell getting all those really uh, good coverage corners. Uh, Jarvis Landry is definitely eating, getting the, getting the better matchups here. The second to last game we've got for today is the Chiefs and the Titans. The Titans pulling off a, a upset win here against the Kansas City Chiefs, winning 35 to 32 on the Chiefs side. So Patrick Mahomes comes back from disloading, dislocating his kneecap just two weeks ago, goes 36 of 50 for 446 yards and three touchdowns is just ridiculous. QB one with 44.84 points. Damian Williams is still the the running back of record here, running back 14 with 13.9 points in this one, 77 yards on 19 carries, uh, and does add in 32 yards on five catches. Tyree Kill has a big game here, wide receiver three on the week with 33 yards, 157 yards, one touchdown, and 11 uh, on 11 receptions. Miko Hardman gets one catch but takes it 63 yards for a touchdown to come in at wide receiver 24 with 13.3 points. And Travis Kelsey continues to dominate, tight end two, 20.5 points in this one, 75 yards, seven catches, one touchdown. I think we're good to go with all the Chiefs moving forward now that Patrick Mahomes is or Pat yeah Patrick Mahomes is back. Uh, we do know they obviously have a bye week in two weeks. They have uh, the Monday night game next week against the Chargers, and I believe they have a bye after that. Uh, but outside of that yep. bye week, you're 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 firing up Williams, Hill, Kelsey, and Mahomes every single week now moving forward, right? Yeah, I think so. Obviously, Tyreek Hill got banged up a little bit yesterday. Yes. I don't see him on the injury listing today, so I'm taking it that it's not too serious, but that'll be something to watch. Next week is the game with the Chargers in Mexico City. Those games are always a little bit weird, but the Chiefs' offense is not their problem. Uh, yesterday, yeah. their defense just really kind of imploded in some big situations and special teams. Their center snaps the ball too early on a field goal attempt that causes them to just have to bail out of it. And then, uh, you know, of course, they get that field goal blocked at the end. So I think that's a concern if you're a Chiefs fan looking at them as a contender into the playoffs because, you know, Patrick Mahomes comes back from dislocating his kneecap and throws for 446 yards and three touchdowns like nothing's happening. Another thing I would monitor is the running back situation. I took McCoy being inactive as a positive sign that Damian Williams had kind of picked back up on that role. He had a brutal fumble yeah. that got returned against them, which wasn't great. Uh, there also was a tweet that came out yesterday that said McCoy's being inactive and a healthy scratch was planned maintenance to keep him fresh for the stretch run. I don't know if that's team speak or if that's real, um, but – that certainly bears watching, you know, are, were we seeing Damian Williams get a heavier workload the last couple of weeks because they're saving McCoy and then they're going to reverse it on us at the last minute. Williams had looked good the week before yesterday. He just looked okay. And he had that kind of brutal mistake. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that does bear watching. He's not somebody I have the same confidence. I do a Hill, Kelsey and Mahomes. Fair enough. On the Titans side, there's no questions about their running back. Derrick Henry just continues to slap both of us in the face every single week. 188 yards, 23 carries, and two touchdowns. I hope you did not listen to the three of us on Thursday and sell him because, my goodness, this dude is just ridiculous. RB1, 33.1 points. Ryan Tannehill, um, you know, surprisingly has a very good game as well. Just 13 and 19, 181, but two touchdowns. Does add 37 yards on the ground to come in at QB 13 with 27.6 points. Um, and then really the only receiving option to do anything, Anthony Ferkser, 36 yards, three catches and a touchdown. Adam Humphreys gets his one catch for a touchdown as well. The Titans back in the playoff race. Ryan Tannehill has, you know, actually looked fairly good for this offense. That all being said, it's just Derrick Henry moving forward, correct? 
Yeah, I think the Titans are a team that are probably a better NFL team than they are a fantasy team. You know, a lot of us had thought maybe John Reece Smith would have a good chance with Walker out. Doesn't do a lot. Adam Humphreys' only target in the game came on that catch for a touchdown late in the fourth quarter, which isn't great. A lot of people had hopes that it would be a big A.J. Brown game with Corey Davis out, only able to get one catch for 17 yards. The passing game is just not reliable for fans. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, they probably they obviously don't care because they're winning games and they want to make the playoffs, but it's insane to think that you know Derrick Henry is going to be the main player here, and yet they still could not stop him. The last game on the docket for us today was probably one of the most surprising games of the day. The Falcons pulling off the win against the Saints, 26-9. On the Falcons' side, Matt Ryan, 20-35, 182, two touchdowns and one interception. To come in at QB 15 with 23.5 points. Devonta Freeman comes in at RB 31 with 7.8 points. Just 38 yards on 10 catches and 3, I'm sorry, uh, 10 rushes. 10 yards on 3 catches. Does get hurt in this one and comes out. Brian Hill enters and has himself a good day after the fact. RB 13, 14 points, 10 points. 61 yards on 20 carries. And then um, just a 10-yard touchdown catch as well that really kind of makes his day. You've got Julio Jones comes in at wide receiver 31 with 10.9 points, 79 yards on three catches, and then Austin Hooper, 17 yards, four catches, one touchdown, does get hurt as well in this one. Tight end 13 with 11.7 points. We have not heard anything for sure on Freeman or Hooper's injuries just yet. Hooper's does sound to be a little bit more serious from some of the stuff that I saw with him going in for the MRI on the knee, so I would be a little bit more worried about Hooper, especially as good as he has been at the tight end position. Uh, if Freeman is out, are you trusting or are you running to the waiver wire to try and grab Brian Hill when Ito you know, Smith is out as well as possibly someone you could throw in as an RB2 or flex moving forward for the Falcons? Yeah, I mean, I think some opportunities there. He obviously made the most of it. Uh, Freeman scheduled for an MRI with a foot sprain. I think we had talked about when we did our uh, sell highs that – not only was his efficiency not great, but he was always kind of an injury risk, and you see it pop up uh, right away again. So, you know, for any team, uh, the running back that you know is going to get a majority of the carries is always worth uh, throwing in your lineup. So somebody I would definitely look at. Yeah, I'm right there with you on that. On the Saints side, we talked about Alvin Kamara earlier and just kind of what he has looked like. I mean, he, he does actually come through. With a decent game here, at least for fantasy, does come in as a uh, running back 10 with 15.4 points. Just 24 yards on four carries, but does add 50 yards on eight catches. Drew Brees struggles mightily in this one. 32 of 45, 287 yards, comes in at QB 18. Um, I see Michael Thomas just continues to dominate. My God, he's good. 152 yards on 13 catches. Jared Cook, 74 yards on six catches. Tied in eight with 13.4 points. We talked about it earlier with Kamara kind of struggling. Are you worried about him at all, or how worried are you about him? Because I really feel like we've talked about, even with Drew Brees there and Te when Teddy came in and filled in for him, it was just Kamara and Thomas, and when Kamara was out, Murray and Thomas. I almost feel like as crazy as it is to say, it's just Thomas for me that I feel comfortable starting every week. What about you? Yeah, Kamara's probably more of an RB2. I mean, he's still getting a lot of uh, action in the passing game as well. Had 10 targets, caught 8 for 50. That's going to give you a pretty uh, stable floor. But we're just not – we're not seeing the touchdowns. We're not seeing the big plays. And we're really not seeing a lot in general in the rushing game. But it was a weird game because they were down a lot um, for a majority of the game. Only 11 carries, 52 yards as a team. Uh, so – I don't know how much that's uh, factoring into it, but, you know, it's definitely, we, we talked about a little bit with Barkley, the same, same thing with Kamara. It's not that they've been absolute disasters or not been there. It's just you feel like when they're lined up, you have to start them. Same kind of with even living on Bell. You have to start them. You're just not getting the return we've gotten in previous years. 
Yeah, I mean, again, I kind of feel like we've had this discussion before with other players. Where you drafted him, you have to play him, but I'm with you. I think you kind of, you almost have to lower your expectations to kind of an RB2 now moving forward. I don't know if he's still kind of dealing with lingering injury issues. Uh, One thing I would point out, too, that does kind of scare me is we actually saw this happen with the Saints last year as well. They had a really good offense most of the season, and then the back half of the season last year, they really kind of fell off. Uh, I, I would be interested to see if that continues to happen. Happen this year. Maybe it's something with Breeze. Uh, you know, he is getting older, is still playing right now with a surgically repaired thumb that just happened eight, nine weeks ago at this point. So, might be something to watch moving forward as well uh, with them. But, you know, until until we see more out of them, you still have to play Kamara. And I imagine there's no way he, he ends up falling off of even a flex value. So, you've got to keep playing him every week. But, I mean, Latavius Murray did look good. If you own Kamara and Murray, maybe you're hoping for them to just say, Kamara's hurt, we're going to sit him and, and throw Murray in there. Matt, thank you so much for joining me today. Hope you enjoy the Monday night football game tonight, which looks like it should be a good one with the Seahawks and the 49ers, and I look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Yep, sounds good. As a small business owner, you deserve more. More confidence, more connectivity, more of the tools that help your business thrive. And at Cox Business, you can expect more from us. We don't just have sales reps. We have perfect plan identifiers, people who will work with you to make sure your business gets everything it needs and nothing that it doesn't. Your business deserves more, and that's why you can expect more from Cox Business. Call 800-526-8572 to switch today. As a small business owner, you deserve more. More confidence, more connectivity, more of the tools that help your business thrive. And at Cox Business, you can expect more from us. We don't just have sales reps. We have perfect plan identifiers, people who will work with you to make sure your business gets everything it needs and nothing that it doesn't. Your business deserves more, and that's why you can expect more from Cox Business. Call 800-526-8572 to switch today.